a very good morning. It's indeed my honor and privilege to bring to you today's very first program, a journalist perspective and inside of you as a part of the International Colloquium on World Freedom of Press Day, organized by the Department of Visual Communication, Kumaruguru College of Liberal Arts and Science, Coimbatore. Today we have with us Mr. J. Sam da Daniel Stalin, the Bureau Chief of NDTV Chennai. Mr. Sam Daniel is an award-winning senior television journalist and news anchor. He is a household name in India, as well as the diaspora, known for his credible, unbiased and ethical television news reporting. He's a seasoned television journalist with proven leadership and 20 years of reporting experience across seven countries, including US and European countries, with the premier NDTV 24-7. And he presently heads the bureau in Chennai. Very rightly, taking his viewership through the digital transformation of news, he also reports widely on NDTV's digital and new media platform. In fact, he was the first to report from ground zero when the tsunami struck in India's Nagapatnam. Mr. Sam Daniel is a British Sheving scholar, international visitor, leadership program alumnus, the Media Project Fellow, and Rotary International's Group Study Exchange Scholar. He's also been chosen for several international fellowships in the US, UK, Germany, Belgium, Holland, and Nepal. He's also the recipient of the Excellence Leadership Award, Electronic Media, in 2015, and was recently given the Global Tamils Media Icon Award. He also anchors news segments, co-anchors shows, does live reports and interviews, and contributes to many flagship programs on NDTV, including The Big Fight, Agenda, Truth vs. Hype, We the People, Left, Right, and Center. He has interviewed a range of national and international leaders, sports champions, Nobel laureates, celebrities, and newsmakers, and has addressed a TEDx meet and mentored around 50 budding journalists. Today, it's indeed an honor to have him kickstart the very first session of the International Colloquium on World Freedom of Press Day. Thank you, sir for taking time out of your busy schedule and spending these precious moments to inspire the next generation of budding journalists in our country today. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Professor Ananda, and uh, lovely to speak to you and your students through this on this special day for we as journalists. I won't take much time so that we'll have more time for interaction with uh, your students. Yes, uh, if you are referring to the world, Press Freedom Index rankings of 2021, India doesn't do very well in that. In fact, we stand number 142 when countries like Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Costa Rica have taken up the first five positions. And still, although India has a very thriving uh, media, thriving journalism, there are also equally many reports of journalists being threatened, their lives being killed. Uh, many run over by vehicles deliberately when they expose uh, many wrongdoings. A few specific instances. Recently, many journalists were arrested for their reportage on the COVID pandemic across the country. Many also faced uh, cases like sedition. And uh, in Tamil Nadu, for instance, uh, a few months ago, we a few group of uh, uh, men who ran a YouTube channel were arrested under the Gunders Act for their program on uh, on or their comments on a religious uh, song, a traditional religious song. And uh, the new uh, digital in IT Act as well, uh, many would say, attempts to scuttle or scuffle media and could be again of a great threat to the vibrant uh, digital uh, reportage or uh, uh, platform India enjoys at the moment. Uh, a few months ago, a journalist who had exposed an attempt to encroach a water body in the nearby, I think, Chengalpata Kanchipuram district was attacked by a group of uh, 
goons and he lost his life. Investigation is on into that. Besides, there are many state governments and central governments, uh, and even the central government that's being accused of uh, uh, denying government advertisements to media houses, newspapers, which may actually uh, be critical of the government or may carry inconvenient reports uh, to the government. Uh, I should clarify, I'm speaking to you as uh, a journalist in my personal capacity, and I don't represent the organization NDTV I work for. And uh, otherwise, I think uh, the digital uh, platform across the country has opened up new opportunities. Technology, smartphones have enabled every one of you to be a kind of a journalist in that sense. Maybe you can call yourself a citizen journalist. And in that sense, uh, both the rights the Constitution of India has enshrined for every individual to express their thoughts and ideas freely and the technology in that sense has given a new power to every individual in that sense to be able to even report issues which the mainstream media may not take it up. And in that sense, often the mainstream media uh, is kept on the toes because of the unlimited kind of reports uh, that come up on the social media. And we get many things uh, picked up from social media as well. I would, I would also add, Social media, despite many shortcomings, not everything you see on social media is verified, is credible, is true. But certainly, it at least gives an opportunity for the citizens to draw attention, to report, to expose. And uh, while we may have to, as a community, mature over the years uh, to make sure that what we share on social media is equally accountable, responsible and truthful to a large extent. I think with this, uh, I would like to take any questions your students may have so that, that it could be more meaningful and interesting. Thank you so much, sir. Very true, very rightly put. In fact, you've addressed many of the questions which our students themselves have. Um, I would like to bring to you our first student, Abhishri, who has a question for you. Hello, sir. Hi, I'm First year visual communication department, sir. And my question for you is, sir, what are the changes in the field of press in this pandemic, sir? Well, the way we report has uh, changed a lot because of the pandemic. Initially, at least, we had a few months of complete lockdown, which means although technically the media was allowed to go wherever they want, uh, not many people we would normally meet then not, not many places we would normally visit. We had many kind of restrictions. So we largely depended on social media to understand what is happening on the ground. We depended on technology, speaking to people, looking at the videos, what people share. But yes, because of lack of transport, because of safety issues, because of uh, restrictions by the government, uh, we could not report from the ground largely. But still, I think the media did a fantastic uh, job. Many. Uh, still journalists went uh, to the locations, for example, uh, the situation at hospitals, situation at mortuaries, situation at crematoriums, and also situations at railway stations, situations at uh, the way the migrant laborers were walking all the way for hundreds of kilometers from one state to another, shortage of food, shortage of medicine, all these were brought to light. So I wouldn't say media uh, was... Uh, forced to go slow because of the pandemic. I think uh, hats off to those bold journalists. Many took it as a challenge, took it as a responsibility. Many journalists also contracted the virus and died, but the news was told. Of course, there were challenges. The revenue was hit because uh, uh, when the lockdown was there, the industry was not doing well. So media largely depends on revenue from advertisements. So uh, many News media houses did not get the re usual revenue in that sense. It also resulted in many losing jobs, many shut down, many smaller organizations shut down. And many newspapers had to reduce the number of pages. Many also underwent salary cuts besides job losses. But despite all these things, I think the media was able to inform people uh, the truth, what is happening on the ground. 
very very sir. very rightly put sir thank you so much sir uh, we have the next question from uh, adrian floyd and uh, he is one of our students nri students who's coming from uae you can see him very proudly displaying his flag at the back so adrian has a question for you sir yes sir um sir i have a question it's like what's the most challenging thing as a bureau chief like what what is the most challenging thing you have done or what is it i think over the years it changes uh, from year to year or from position to position uh, one challenging thing is sometimes the government is determined to not let information pass through for example in tamil nadu every 5 years we used to have a change of guard so one i will name but one government is known to let press have a free hand the ministers may lie but still you can go ask them you can question them you can hold them to account but earlier for a long time one government was also known for not sharing information when that government is in power when that party is in power even the collectors will not speak senior officers will not speak sps will not speak so it becomes difficult to get authentic information and in that sense their point of view is that once you do not share information those things will not appear in papers or news uh, or news channels but that you can't as a journalist you cannot let things go that way so you have to uh, cultivate your sources you have to find innovative methods to 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 get credible information to ask tough questions to those in power and make sure you still do your job correctly maybe it would mean that an officer may not Uh, give a response on record, but at least you're able to speak to them, get a response off off record, off camera, and you can attribute that to sources. But still, people who read your news, people who watch your news, will get to know what is happening, what is the logic behind a government's move, or what is the excuse, what is the reason the government is trying to give, or what is the response for any lapses they are having, that kind of a thing. That's one challenge: information dissemination of information. but i think over the years there are changing second information is that social media has one flip side uh, for example earlier uh, there used to be frequent press interactions you can ask questions you can ask tough questions you can get a response but now using social media the news makers be it the government be it officers be it stars or celebrities they themselves become news breakers which means they don't need an intermediary like journalist to share or to take the news from them to the people because the technology makes it possible for themselves to share it which means the chance for them to be scrutinized to come under media scrutiny becomes very very less so there could be a leader there could be a president there could be a prime minister who seem to be very active on social media but the point is that they're also in a sense many would say turning autocratic because they don't really subject themselves to be questioned because we journalists we're not judges but at least we represent the anxiety the worries the concerns the pains of the ordinary man and when we ask questions we represent the large bulk of people the mass of people the, the large masses across the country and when they don't allow that to happen that again is not a healthy democracy that's not a sign of a healthy democracy uh, we, we 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 look forward to so these are large challenges i would say thank you sir very very rightly put sir very true um, we have a question now from bhavadharni yes yes bhavadharni good morning sir this is good morning sir this is bhavadharni doing my final year so how will you manage your schedules and deadlines sir Well, deadlines. Yes, whatever is a major news. Uh, supposing if that story is listed for a prime time, we have to give it by. We have to get the script ready by four o'clock, four thirty-five, so that the script can be checked, and then we can start the editing process so that the story will be on time for the uh, eight o'clock bulletin. But otherwise, you get into a kind of uh, uh, once you get a clear understanding of the work you do, then you line up your guests, you plan your travel. sometimes i mean now technology makes it easier so that uh, 
uh, you don't have to come back to office to send everything. Technology makes it possible from wherever you shoot, you can send your footage to, to, to your office. It can be edited. But I think a little bit of planning helps. If it involves travel, then you accordingly plan a, a, a day before, you leave early, you fix the people. Supposing if you're going to report, say, for example, election coverage on the counting day, then probably you can expect, okay, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we should have the clear trends coming in. If this party is winning, you fix a guess. Okay, I may come to your office, I may call you for a, uh, we may dial you on a Zoom to get your reactions. If this party wins, so you have a kind of a plan A, plan B, plan C. Then to report from the ground, you expect, you plan again, which is the place where a large development is likely to take place, which is the most likely to happen. Then you position yourself in that party headquarters like that. Otherwise, there are times where you can't plan. Suddenly something happens. Then there are different ways of conveying the story. It can be a live report because you don't have time to edit the story. Or it can be a pre-recorded walkabout. Say, for example, there is a, a, a crisis, a bomb blast. Uh, maybe a leader has died. Then you may not have time to do a full story there. Then you walk around that place. You record everything in two, three minutes. You send the whole thing. So people will get a sense of what is happening there. And without any need for wasting time in editing, you can still carry the news. Flashes immediately. It all begins with flashes. So I think we get a sense of how much of time you take to write your script. Sometimes when you drive, you finish your script. You know, you don't waste time to come back. You use a headphone, listen to the interviews in the car itself, what the leader has spoken, what those people have spoken. So sometimes, say for example, there is a kind of a prime minister's meeting in Chennai at five o'clock. Today's last political meeting at five o'clock. Two days later, we have the elections. So before it's before you go for the meeting itself, sometimes you prepare the broad outline of a script because certain facts remain unchanged. So in the beginning, the most important highlight of the prime minister's speech alone, you may have to add quickly. So even if his speech ends at seven o'clock, eight o'clock, you will have the story ready for the prime time because. Already, you had have, you have got, the, got the script ready. You had to just tweak the initial, the most important part of the prime minister's speech. So that way, you plan everything. And once you get into that, of course, you would, when you're young, when you're new to the industry, you would miss certain deadlines. You will come, and that's how you also learn everything. And uh, now, technology makes it possible. You don't have to physically go to a person to do an interview. You can connect them on Skype. You can connect them on Zoom. That's also making it easier. They themselves record and give you the interviews. You can send the questions. So all these things, a mix of planning, technology, experience. I think you will do a good job that way. Uh, sir, I have a question for you right now, actually. I know yes. that you were reporting from Madurai in those uh, pre-WhatsApp and uh, pre-digital uh, era. Uh, how did you manage at that time? I mean, could you please throw some light on your experience about the pre-digital era? That's a lovely question. Yes, those days, it was between 2000 and 2005. We didn't have Blackberries, we didn't have iPhones, we didn't have internets, we didn't have uh, WhatsApps. Okay, so the only option was we had a flight from Madurai to Chennai. 12.30 was the flight. You had to come to the airport before 12 o'clock so that you can book the, and the cassette, the audio, the video cassette has to be sent to our Chennai office. So you come early to the airport, book it. If you're a little late, the counter will be closed. Then you request passengers. Sir, I'm from NDTV. People know you sometimes because they've received you on TV. You show your ID card. You give the tapes to them and you call your office. A man called Sampath is coming there. He'll be wearing a black colored T-shirt, a blue jean. You give the number. Somebody will come and pick it up. Sometimes you send by dry, through drivers who, uh, from Chennai, my mother to Salem, and Chennai buses come, you know, you give it to them. Otherwise, you courier. So if you miss the 12 o'clock, then that story will not make it to the evening bulletin because there was no internet, that kind of a thing. And that's the only way. And uh, I, one example I can still remember. Sometimes we travel for four hours. There was a bomb blast at a mosque in Tirunal Valley. We learned about it around 7 o'clock. We immediately started. We drove three hours to Tirunal Valley. We had just 20 minutes to shoot that story. So as, you ha as the young lady asked me earlier, we planned. Okay, we have only 20 minutes. Very limited shot. We won't have time for a detailed shoot. So where is the damage? A wide shot of the, of the mosque. Some uh, people there worried about this thing some eyewitness interview. 
and there was a police at that time you normally get a police interview by a senior officer like an sp or dig but if you have to go to their office you will miss the flight so we planned there was one small level i think a sub inspector standing there sometimes when you ask them sir will you speak to them they'll become conscious they'll say no so we planned okay we'll just go put the mic there what we call as gate crashing if he responds that will be a good response to use it as a police version so we planned i told my camera person keep the camera rolling i'm going to just ask this question if he is answering good you lose that we will ignore it and i asked him like you know, he said this is what happened we suspect this group so we used that as a police because for a bomb blast story without the police's views the story is incomplete and he gave a good bite normally that would not happen but as a journalist you try all your tricks in your and your sleeves to try and then we rushed back we again were able to make it because what i'm trying to say we traveled 6 hours up and down but for the shooting at the spot we had just spent 20 minutes for that and that's how uh, things work and now now if you look at, look back those days again another thing i can uh, there was a cyclone again no internet we had only a car we followed from madurai went to nagapattinam there was a flight at 9 o'clock in tiruchi so we woke up the collector around 12 13 in the night he was very nice he gave an interview at the night the night then he said i'm coming to the sea shore in the morning for inspection so he came at 6 o'clock it was slightly brighter we took visuals of the choppy sea the collector inspecting arrangements they we interviewed him rushed to trichy and the story made it in the afternoon because from trichy the flight took the tape to chennai again the cyclone which was to hit nagapatnam it changed its course it went towards rameshwaram then we again rode towards madurai went to rameshwaram so you won't believe 900 kilometers in two days without any rest you know that kind of a travel pouring rain everywhere but yeah those days were amazing. but now you will get empty number of footage from every place you know you don't have to really be there but those days if you're not there yourself other people will not even give you the footage because so much of competition very few channels and we didn't have the culture because footage was precious but now footage somebody would have taken the hard would have, would have, would have done a hard work going to the location next 5 minutes it goes worldwide on twitter or whatsapp and we really don't care about the difficulty the other person would have taken to shoot it but regardless of that nobody is even giving him or her a courtesy but technology has made that so simple so undermining the hard work also in that sense i can absolutely understand sir uh, we have a question from uh, sandeep over here uh, sandeep hi, hi sir. sir good morning how are you sir good good thank you how are you okay sir i am good sir so i have one question how can we reduce the digital divide in developing countries I think it's a great question the only way to reduce the digital divide is to make internet affordable to make smartphones affordable uh, many for example a few years ago were complaining about why a particular government had chosen to that famous 1.7 lakh crore loss to the government well i'm not supporting any party but the government at that point in time claimed that they took a conscious decision to make what we call the the bandwidth or whatever technically technically you call it that cheaper so that internet connectivity becomes cheaper remember when mobile phones came we have spent 17 rupees to make a one minute call an ordinary basic nokia phone which didn't have internet which didn't have the features of a smartphone at times used to cost 14 15000 rupees but the fact that now for a 2 or 3000 rupees you're able to get a smartphone a functional phone with internet of 2 gb data for a monthly fee of 400 rupees that is a game changer and still there are populations who do not know about internet who are not able to really reap the benefits of the digital revolution we are enjoying it and for them also even now owning a smartphone is very very unimaginable going for internet to pay even a simple 300 rupees every month is very very unaffordable for them and they are denied the fruits of it the fruits of development to book a ticket to buy something online to see what is happening around them right on their mobile all these are being denied to them because they are not able to afford so one is that to make it cheaper uh, internet has become something like a life breath now 
that's the only way the government should not see it as an opportunity to make money to make profits but as an equalizer as something which could actually elevate people give them opportunities to develop opportunities to learn and that way i think even this pandemic in that sense has come as a blessing in disguise because this has exposed a large population of the possibilities of internet popular pop, the possibilities in it and once you make that uh, cheaper affordable then i think half the battle is won very 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 rightly put sir in fact that's so true the pandemic has literally uh, made us realize the huge amount of digital divide in the country and one more thing which i feel uh, has happened during this pandemic is the sudden spread the rampant spread of misinformation and disinformation which becomes the corollary also because of the amount of digital spread around the country we have a lot of disinformation how have you as a journalist handled that aspect sir well we should all understand that we are not only consumers in that sense we are also creators or we are also perpetrators of information so if you find something newsworthy before you share think for a second whether it's true is it a hype is it a fake does it have a vested interest has it been written with an agenda there could be political parties there could be business people companies individuals trying to score over another person for various reasons political competition rivalry they could be spreading deliberately fake news partially true news a mix of good and bad news correct and uh, inaccurate news so we should be very very careful that even if somebody has forwarded you don't blindly forward that just because it's it's nice to read so if everyone exercises that caution then half the battle is won second one anything that is written beautifully but does not have a, the source of information it can be a news channel it can be a news organization it can be a an individual professor it can be an expert if it does not mention the technical details of the source like a website like a facebook page or at least the name of the author immediately something should strike you that it should be a fake because it is also true that spreading fake news disinformation misinformation is a huge industry like how you try to convey correct news as a journalist there are also hundreds of people who engage professional writers who engage public relations people who people who engage content writers to suit their agenda maybe a political party is trying to spread wrong news about their op opposition party maybe one company is trying to spread something against another competing company or a rival company or one individual maybe i don't like my boss maybe i'm trying to use somebody to write something bad about him or her so all those things are quite possible and this is a reality so the the statistics say 95% of what you see on social media is unverified fake with agenda with vested interest i'll give you one simple example during the jallikat to crisis when we had the huge protest taking taking place at the along the marina beach a few years ago the last day the protest ended suddenly we get a phone call all the whatsapp the buzz saying that the police station at the i south area in uh, triple k near the marina beach the police station has been set on fire a few tamil channels were flashing english channels were flashing all the whatsapp facebook were showing that one channel even showed a long view of smoke coming from that area making one believe okay even journalists could have believed that because they showing a fire from a building which they say is a police station but what is your basic role a journalist should not believe what he sees should not believe what he hears he or she should actually investigate verify and then flash so i immediately called the police commissioner naturally he was busy because there was clashes at the time he didn't take the call i called a few other senior officers nobody picked up then suddenly i searched the google for the i south police station landline number i called a lady picked up the phone she told me the same thing sir enga oriya police station la fire kedaadu enga police station ku velila or 10 15 
டூ வீலர்ஸ் நின்று இருந்துச்சு அதை யாரோ தீப்பத்தி வச்சுட்டாங்க வாட் இஸ் இஸ் நோ ஃபயர் ஆன் த போலீஸ் ஸ்டேஷன் வி ஹேட் சம் டுவெண்ட்டி தேர்ட்டி டூ வீலர்ஸ் பார்க் அவுட் சைட் த போலீஸ் ஸ்டேஷன் சம்படி ஹேஸ் செட் தம் ஆன் ஃபயர் சோ தென் ஐ ஃபிளாஷ் சேயிங் தட் vehicles parked outside this particular police station set on fire while other channels many said many, many claimed that the police station has been set on fire of course in tamil nadu there are certain channels run by the ruling party there are certain channels run by the opposition party so when one party is in power the other channel run by the opposition party will exaggerate will blow things out of proportion but as a journalist it's important you make that So you take the trouble to make those phone calls to verify and then you maybe 8 out of 10 times what you see on those channels could be completely correct but the one time you fail to do your due diligence if you are found to be true uh, wrong then you lose your credibility you should endeavor to build a name for yourself if this reporter if this journalist if this media organization flashes it cannot be wrong so you can be late but you can never be wrong accuracy i mean speed will not always justify something going wrong no you have to be speed fast but what is even more important is are you accurate are you correct otherwise uh, things could go wrong you may ruin your own credibility you may ruin your own credibility the credibility of the organization you work for so these are challenges and uh, Uh, yeah i think if you follow these guidelines i think if you start stopping sharing of information then itself that will put a pressure on people who share who create that that those things that people do not take their views seriously i think uh, that's very true even we forget that we are also a part of the chain we need to break that chain on some level very true uh, we have a question now from shakti sneha good morning sir yes, good morning yes. good morning sir so uh, this pandemic would have been a great challenge uh, especially for you being a journalist sir one end you have lots of news to be covered in the other end your health and safety matters a lot how did you get to manage both of these at the time sir very true for a long time as a personal friend i slept in a separate room i tried to keep myself away from my family because we were going in and out sometimes if you're going to areas where there could be uh, an overload of the virus hospitals all those things but yes uh, we took the doses but as a journalist as as a ndtv team we have been given clear guidelines to be followed for example now a uh, guideline for us is to use double mask we have to carry two mask where this uh, uh, surgical mask first and then with a cloth mask or n95 for a long time we have been using hand gloves carry a bottle of uh, uh, hand sanitizers always uh, now for quite some time we are using a longer mic to make sure when you interview people you stay that have the physical distance we still are able to get the interview done without actually getting close to the people uh, we avoid uh, using for a long time ola or uber because that was earlier perceived to be an easy source of work. so we used to drive our own cars now Uh, to, to, so whatever little uh, possibilities of the spread we make sure we try to and then we also have ppes ready with us whenever there was a need for example we covered a story from a hospital treating positive patients using siddha siddha treatment uh, so when we went there we we we, we bought the ppes for the entire crew we and uh, interview the doctor wearing that so that kind of precautions we we take and for quite some time our home became the office for example i think till at least the month of june or july we were all working from home unless it was an absolutely important story to be covered from the ground uh, because there are agencies which supply the footage so you, for everything you don't have to go there but we did a live reports because the technology now has made it very very uh, possible to go live on television using a smartphone so we set up a small office like thing anyway ndtv had moved to what we call as mojo mobile journalism using high quality phones for our coverage so my in my home we had a set up a tripod so we did live reports 
collecting all the news by through phone and reporting live from the then as things came under control i think from july or june onwards we started coming to the office in a very limited way uh, if you can work from home we got it done for interviews those people themselves we send them the question or we record it live using platforms like zoom we record so we don't have to really go for everything to them so we used everything some of our journalists uh, in various organizations have lost their lives have contracted the virus some have issues even now complications but some of uh, we've been able to do our discharge responsibilities uh, to the level best you know as we call it and uh, there are smaller organizations which don't really take care of the uh care of the employees as well sadly still you see in the elections uh, there was kind of a jostling of cameramen with their cameras very standing close to each other you know, uh, creating opportunity or possibility for the virus to spread there is little awareness also uh, little less awareness also among the media fraternity because uh, when the organization case for you then you exercise that precaution but when they ask you i want this done no matter then they are worried about their jobs because already many have lost their jobs and many we, we, they won't say that they won't complain but on the ground you see many journalists especially the foot soldiers people who work for smaller organizations they very my heart out goes out for them they take so much of risk which actually could be avoided say for example there are agencies like ani which cover it anyway you don't have to send all your report cameramen to get the same thing because you're all already subscribing for those uh, agencies so that way i think when i was in london we had a nice example of something big happening bbc would cover and all other channels will get from there likewise they would have a type to other channels but they don't have to really waste resources and make a clutter up because there are say for example when spb died when such people died remember the presence of a large number of media people intruding into the privacy of uh, uh, those families like even recently when vivek died i had posted about this on social media but these are reasons these are occasions where as a media we should be a model but sadly in many areas that is missing but i think things will change but we are also learning but largely it has been a challenging time and uh, we've seen both kind of reporters some people are very very courageous bold and uh, from day one they never showed any signs of fear they've been able to go report from the crowd report from the ground zero some took a very calculated uh, risk, calculated uh, stand i will not go unless it's absolutely important because uh, we don't know what was the what was happening around us Uh, hospitals were running short you know many were losing lives so many journalists also took that decision very consciously reporting in a very limited way uh, following all precautions and everything i think over time we have learned everything and now we are very in that sense we are very well prepared but i think safety should be an utmost a concern and priority for everybody in this field I I really truly respect the covid warriors in in their uh, for their really sacrifice that they're doing and their quest for bringing out the most updated information to us thank you so much sir um we have another question from abhishri sir does the current scenario mandate freedom of press be enshrined in the constitution of india yes sabish i think Uh, there is no special freedom of the press given in the constitution i think we all as individuals we all as citizens have that same freedom of expression which the press also as a professional body claims so there is no exclusive rights or privileges for the press it's what is it's as an individual it's as an individual what you get we also have but how do you use it that's the big question uh are you abusing it that's the big question but uh, it's a it's a it's a the larger point is to what extent you use it is it for a common good say for example there could be uh, your hidden camera story about a personal life of somebody well it could be freedom of expression but it's also a question of intruding into someone's privacy what is the public interest in that so that should be the larger guiding principle when you 
exercise your freedom of expression is it in public interest is it going to serve any do any good thing for society is it trying to expose something which is very bad for the community for the country or is it a kind of uh, what we would call as yellow journalistic uh, approach kind of thing you know but otherwise if you have any specific question on freedom of expression or freedom of the press i can answer you but otherwise the larger point i'm trying to tell you is that press does not enjoy any exclusive rights you as an individual what you have we also have thank you sir thank you sir uh, sir i also want to know there is this trend of citizen journalism in fact even in j schools we have started teaching our students about uh, citizen journalism uh, what is your opinion on that because uh there's a certain amount when when something comes out of a media channel itself uh there is a certain amount of due diligence done but coming from a citizen journalist it's still questionable it's still about self regulation self mediation what is your take on this i think citizen journalism should be there because in one sense they're all watchdogs okay uh say for example earlier still 5 10 years ago when there was no social media the journalism was left completely in the hands of journalists full time journalists who work for established professional media organizations it can be a television it can be a newspaper so if i even if i decide say for example there could be a good story about a sewage problem in my area okay somebody may tell me if i decide not to cover it if i decide okay that's not so important okay today i'm sunday i'm i'm off i can't go and work on that then nobody else will report that then the poor common man who thought i would help now is left helpless but now citizen journalists are also adding to the fleet of or to the battery of journalists available so you put us under pressure one opportunity is that this is not rocket science maybe there is a drinking water crisis maybe there is a sewage leakage maybe there is a need for a good library there so he or she is trying to talk to people report what is going on there there is little scope for factual inaccuracies okay because these are citizen journalists are so normally for what for civic issues for public uh, amenities and things like that where you need an expertise is to check with officials to understand policies to interpret government order there you may require some level of experience some level of contacts to say for example yesterday an order from the tamil nadu government said we are asking all the private hospitals to a lot 50% of uh, hospitals for covid treatment i had a doubt are they talking about the existing hospitals dealing with covid to give 50% of seats uh, beds for covid or are they asking the entire set of private hospitals in the state to give 50% of seats so i immediately call the health secretary now i can call the health secretary a citizen journalist will not be able to do that because he wouldn't have the number even if he has the number maybe the secretary may not take the call like that so there are areas where a journalist his or her role helps but otherwise a citizen journalist is the it is a simple issue so as long as they limit themselves to that kind of a role without giving scope for misinterpretation or misinformation in fact that would help say for example you do a report about huge uh, sewage crisis in your area water leaking out people falling sick there maybe when you put that on the social media on youtube or when you tweet about that maybe the corporation commissioner will see that maybe they'll immediately order something to be done about that maybe a newspaper will also see that and they will send their team to do a full story on that so citizen journalists also pay way for amplification of that news that's why i told you often social media we keep track of because many such things which we would otherwise will not know about comes to our knowledge and it also helps us to understand what is the larger public what what we call as trending what people think about what people talk about because we also want to make sure that we remain in that sense relevant to what is happening around us i am not arguing whatever social media says is correct 
I'm not arguing whatever people want is correct. No. Still, as a journalist, I have to exercise my editorial responsibility to filter whether this report is worth covering, is the story worth telling, is it having any public good. On a lighter note, if we ask people what do they want, some will say, I want pornography. Will you give that? No. So you cannot go by public demand. You can't go by what the large number of people want. No. You're a journalist because you're an editor because you have the responsibility to give what is important, what in your view has to be told, not merely what people would like to see or hear. So in that sense, citizen journalism is very, very good. We need more of that. In fact, we should need over the years, it should become a kind of a, a movement. Maybe every small town, every small part of a city can have their own platforms where people can share their grievances, maybe things happening. For example, there could be a beautiful singer who won an award. A newspaper may not get time to write about that. Maybe an innovation by a child there, a schoolboy or a college girl. When a citizen writes about that, it gets attention of many people to open it up, to get more interest shown on that. So it could, it could lead to many such beautiful things happening around. So it, if it can be organized at a community level, it could even be more effective than working as an individual. Maybe like, like, like how we have Adya Times, Paimbutu Times, you know, little, little areas can have their own citizen journalism platforms. Uh, it could be lovely to see. Uh, so Adrian has a question for you, Adrian. Um, what is your advice to budding journalists who to, intend to take up this profession? Okay, budding journalists in terms of academic qualification, no matter what your degree is, that's perfectly fine. A journalism career does not always require a degree in journalism. Okay, but over the years, many established organizations, be it television news, or be it magazines, be it digital platforms, be it newspapers, they prefer taking people from a professionally run journalism institute or a college. So what I would advise is, even if you're doing Viscom or anything, if you're very particular to get into the media, you can try for jobs soon after your graduation. If you have the skills, we can prove yourself. It's great. Otherwise, it's worth going for a one-year postgraduate diploma in a place like, say, Asian College of Journalism in Chennai or the Symbiosis in Pune, the Manipal Academy in Karnataka, like that. These are known to have industry standards infrastructure in their own campuses. They may have their own in-house uh, television studio kind of thing, in-house television channel where, like a real news organization every day, You'd be required to report news. You'd be required to anchor new segments. So you get to work the same way we do it here. Or you can have, uh, they, they again specialize in both television, newspaper, digital platforms, new media, everything. Secondly, if you're studying in a college like a regular arts and science college, then prepare a, a kind of a, prepare, I mean, create opportunities to make sure by the time you finish your degree, you can be any degree in that matter, to show that you have the skills required to be a journalist. One opportunity could be you can start a blog. So every day you keep writing. It may be a weekly column. You write about that. You interview people and write about that. So when you go for a job interview, you have them to show your work that you are writing. And every time you write, in two months' time, three months' time, every time you write a news article, an interview, your quality will improve. Likewise, you have smartphones. You have a tripod. It doesn't cost you much. So you can maybe you have a guest coming to your college. You can interview that person. Have a YouTube channel for yourself or for your college, for your department. Keep a record of that. So when you go for interview, you can show. What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that whatever you want to become, create opportunities to show that you can do that, that you've done that already. So that the quality may not be world class like the way professional journalists or professional organizations do. But that shows, they will give you, they will value that effort you put in to show that. Because skills can always be taught. You can be trained. But this shows that you have the natural aptitude to do that. And that you have taken the efforts to, to showcase that. So you don't have to go anywhere. Being a college like you are, maybe you get some good VIP, uh, 
chief guest coming there, maybe a sports person in your college, maybe somebody has done something amazing, a good singer, maybe somebody is doing a great job in your district, somebody in an environment place, like anything. It can be a rags to riches story of a industrialist there. If you can interview them using a smartphone, if you can do a small news story like how we do for TV, and do that as a weekly assignment, monthly assignment, and do a PTC like how we speak on TV, the reporter comes there. Start writing good scripts for that. These are ways you can showcase your talent. You can also hone your skills in the three-year time you have in your college. So that when you apply for a job, you can list all these things. That's one thing. Lastly, you can also seek internship. If you want to become a newspaper journalist, maybe summer vacation, start preparing at least two, three months before your vacation. Write to a few newspaper organizations. Go to meet your Hindu express office in your town any digital offices in a town, check whether you can come for an internship for a month. They'll be happy to take you because you, you in a sense, freely work for them and you learn from them. You know? And they will give you bylines to publish when they do. If it's a television channel, a local television channel, you, you can interview somebody, who knows? You, know? you can all get those opportunities. You can come to Chennai for an internship in newspapers, television. All these things are possible. And now Twitter, Facebook makes it possible for you to connect with anybody. Anybody can search Rajdeep Dasar Desai, Barkar, that Sonia saying, you know, anything is possible. They can respond to you. So gone are the days when connecting with people, for connecting with people who needed connections. No, anybody can connect with somebody. With your, if you keep trying, I'm sure opportunities will open up. You can go to work in even headquarters of a Delhi office like NDTV or IBN or BBC. Anything is possible nowadays. So if you can work on these lines to prepare yourself for the skills you know. So basically writing. If you want to become a television journalist or for a digital or for newspaper, writing is very, very important. And make sure you learn these things. As you write more, because for example, in TV, within one minute, I should tell the story, what a newspaper can write about in thousand words. So how do we decide what are the important points to be told in that story? What are the points which we can ignore when you write for television? Like that script writing, all these things, every time you do a story, you will learn. And I'm sure this will help you to get your dream job. Just try, try, try. I'm sure opportunities will open up. Very, very, very true, sir. Uh, in fact, yes, we also keep insisting that students should go ahead and do an internship. It makes a lot of sense. So then to, uh, to, to understand whether they have an actual flair to do to pursue that profession or not. That's very right. true. Uh, we have one last question from Sandeep Yo. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think about the current social media? So like we have a lot of people uh, posting about it. It's almost like a uh, mini journalism. So do you think this will support journalism in India or uh, do you think it's like it will uh, help uh, journalism decline? It's both ways. As I told you, Sandeep, uh, social media amplifies things which otherwise do not get coverage, otherwise do not get space in uh, mainstream media. So if it is good, automatically people share. It comes to the notice of the government, something like that. So it, 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 it has a good purpose behind that. But often social media is also used to spread fake news, to spread hatred, to spread wrong information. And I think over the years, we will have to still mature what we post because Social media gives you that, say, for example, I can't write anything as I want. Whatever uh, I write, there will be an editor who will go through that, who will approve it. Only then it goes for public consumption or public to get a read. Whereas in, in social media, there is no editor. There is nobody monitoring what you say, how you say everything. So suddenly you feel happy about something, you flash. Suddenly you feel angry about something, you immediately blast it out on Twitter. Or on Twitter. And that's, that's not the way it should be. So I think over a period of time, uh, perhaps social media could become part of our even school curriculum to, to, to train children how to present the etiquette of social media. But otherwise, social media has become a huge, huge uh, uh, empowering tool in the hands of the common people. But there is a risk beyond this. For example, we are, we are now reaching a situation where for everything, people go to social media. That's something uh, restricts your reading, your quality reading, restricts your family time. And uh, and it, it somehow brings your whole world into your phone. You, you don't even spend much time 
talking to each other meeting friends going out you know it, it, that's that's something very very uh, could be dangerous it, it completely social media changes. in one way is actually making man lesser of a social animal right very true very true absolutely you're right you bang on so that's something which we'll have to take a call how much time do we spend on social media and unconsciously we are also becoming pawns in the hands of big companies which own these social media because we don't understand social media is also a multi billion dollar business for many people for many companies and ultimately every time you use your social media they know about where you go they know about who you talk they know about what you like what food you order they know about what dresses you like they know about what kind of words everything becomes open and what we would normally think it's private you are happily giving them on a platter every time you download an app they allow you to use the app only when you accept them to access your contacts access your camera access everything but early we would never be comfortable but now the technology has made us so entangled so addicted to social media we have no second thoughts we have no option if you say no to those apps you can't download and use those apps and that's something we'll have to really think about as i said told you social media is also at the government level completely making authorities very autocratic they could be a good popular leader who projects himself to be reaching out to people by being very active by giving messages by talking through social media but they really don't expose themselves to be questioned they really don't expose themselves to be scrutinized and that unconsciously is grooming a breed of new leaders who could technically be autocrats but projecting themselves to be very democratic and these are questions to be thought about the the effects the business behind this how they uh, mold our opinion how they shape because there is so much of technology which also what we call as algorithms and and there are, there is so much science technology business interest gimmicks behind that and for a common layman social media is not that social not that democratic as we think to be or uh, or as they try to make us believe that no it's a big business ultimately these companies have their own selfish interests say for example the same companies which think which claim that they're very democratic they're also trying to become partners around the world to make sure there'll be no rivals for them to make sure there'll be no business rivals they crush competition there are so many things like that so i think we should be very mature very clear and and very well informed about this to know also the other what we call as the dark and the underbelly of social media as well as the it the, the larger it which has enabled all these things yes without technology we wouldn't be able to have this kind of a global reach now but all these things also come with a price and i think we should take a clear we should have a clear understanding of that and know when to say no for certain things otherwise i think uh, we would be uh, creating a platform which is beyond anyone's control you know in that sense very very true very very rightly put sir uh thank you so much sir today for taking out so much of time in fact what we planned as a half an hour session has gone on to almost an hour because uh, there was so there was there were so many interesting things that we talked about um and you have really done a great job today by uh, sharing that with our students and in one way i'm sure they will be really happy and uh, influenced and inspired by people like you who have taken out their time to come and speak to them thank you so much sir my heartfelt gratitude to you thank you very much it's a joy always to talk to young students particularly those who show interest in journalism i've been a teacher myself for 5 years and it's always gets it's nice to get back to classroom you can follow me on twitter i am on j sam daniel and your teacher may give you my phone number any doubts i'll be happy to answer your calls or you can whatsapp me i'll try to respond if you have not been able to ask your questions now thank you very much all the best thank you so much sir thank you sir so we have a host of events left today this is just the beginning we have one more journalist session 
It's just about to start in the next 30 seconds. Do not forget to fill up the feedback form. There's a feedback code for this particular session, which I'm going to be flashing on the screen right now. You will need to use this to fill up your feedback form for this session. Thank you so much. Do stay tuned for lots and lots of events for the rest of the day. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Stay tuned and welcome to class.